Hello everyone, I'm Alex Dykes, and today we're out in the rain taking a look at the 2013 Chevy Volt. Now, there have been some slight changes for 2013, that's why we're taking a look at the Volt again. But before we dive on inside, let's talk about what the Volt is and what the Volt isn't, because that's really important and it's something that a lot of people are confused about. There aren't really any exterior changes for 2013, so we still have these classic Chevy good looks up front with the blanked out grille because, of course, aerodynamics are an important concern with any EV or hybrid vehicle. That's what's going on up here. This reduces the drag by blocking off a large portion of the front of the vehicle. If this profile looks familiar to you, you're not seeing things. It is essentially the same shape that the Prius and the Insight liftbacks use. And that's, of course, because it's very aerodynamically efficient as well as very practical with that liftback. Out back, we have these angry Chevy tail lamps, which I think are quite attractive, and we have a single backup light. Now, that backup light is a little bit of a problem because it is kind of dim, and when you're reversing at night and you're looking at the backup camera, you just sort of get this little cone of light behind you in the backup camera, but it is quite attractive back here. Let's talk about what the Chevy Volt is and what it isn't. Now, GM is calling this an electric vehicle with a range extender, so back here we have a fuel door. Up front, you'll find a power port because you plug the Volt in like you would plug in a Leaf or any other EV but we also have that gas tank and this gasoline engine up front. So how does this differ from a Fisker Karma, which is something that a lot of people equate the Volt to? Well, the Fisker Karma has an engine and a generator, and that generates power, and then we have an electric motor and a battery pack. But the, uh, the gasoline engine can never power the car directly under any circumstances in a Fisker Karma. However, in the Volt, it can, because this transmission has four modes of operation. It can operate in EV mode, it can operate in a serial hybrid mode, where just like the Fisker Karma, the engine generates electricity, which sends it off to the motor and it drives forward. We have a twin motor operation where the two electric motor generators in this car work together to improve EV efficiency at higher speeds. And then we have a parallel hybrid mode where this combination operates essentially like a Prius or any of the Ford hybrids. If you want to know more information about that, we're going to pop some links down below because I hate to bore you with the details. But because of all those mixed modes of operation, especially that parallel hybrid mode where it operates like a Prius or a Ford hybrid, I would call the Volt a hybrid vehicle uh, that has a plug-in feature. And strangely enough, GM is calling the new Cadillac uh, ELR, which is based on the Chevy Volt, a plug-in hybrid, not an electric vehicle with a range extender. Here under the hood, we'll find a few things. First up, we'll find a 111 kilowatt or 149 horsepower electric motor. It provides 273 pound-feet of torque, which is a great deal more than you'd find in a Prius, so it's no surprise that this vehicle is a lot faster than a Prius. The next thing you'll find is a 54 kilowatt or 72 horsepower secondary motor generator, and that can either act as a generator or act as a motor, and the car will use those two together to drive the car more efficiently at certain times, or it can decouple that uh, extra 54 kilowatt hour motor, turn it into a generator, and generate power using this engine that's under the hood. Now this is an 84 horsepower engine, approximately, 50, uh, 63 kilowatts, I should say. So you've got to get those kilowatts and horsepower correct these days. And this drivetrain is arranged very similarly to a Prius or a Ford hybrid drivetrain. You know, it's a planetary gear set. Again, we'll pop some links down below on that one. But what you need to know about this situation right under here is that it operates very much like those Ford plug-ins or the Toyota plug-in vehicles with one important exception. And that exception is that it can decouple that uh, 72 horsepower generator and that 84 horsepower engine, and it can couple them together separately from the drivetrain. So it can generate electricity while the vehicle is not moving and that engine is providing no motive assistance to propel the vehicle forward. That cannot happen in a Prius or a Ford hybrid. Whenever the engine is operating, it's providing some assistance to the vehicle moving forward. And that's accomplished by some extra clutch packs in this transmission versus that Toyota or Ford setup. Let's talk about rear seat comfort first because the battery is located in the middle of this vehicle. It runs the length of the car. It's a 16.5 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery. It's about 10 and a half kilowatts hour of usable power. It also runs behind these rear seats, sort of in a T configuration in the vehicle. That means that the Volt is a four seater vehicle only. That's an important consideration when you compare this to something like a Leaf or uh, you know, a Ford C-Max Energy or a Toyota Prius plug-in. Now, ingress and egress in this car is a little bit tricky because the wheelbase in the Volt is not terribly long. This front seat's adjusted for a six foot two passenger that I had in the car. You can see my legs are touching it. Um, really, legroom is not so much of a problem as it is headroom in this car. Getting in and out of it is a little bit tricky with this sort of coupe-like profile going on here. It is decidedly good looking on the outside because of this low profile. Just keep that in mind if you try and carry larger passengers in the rear. Now, <clears throat> I'll try and scoot over to this other seat so you can see what's going on here. We do have 
rear seats that do fold, oops, this seat would fold if this front seat was further forward. Let's move that up. There we go. So these rear seats do fold almost completely flat with the rear cargo area, allowing you to drag cargo forward. Now we have the optional rear armrest here, which does come out and it's removable because otherwise it would stick up for that rear cargo area when you fold those seats forward. Like most large hatchbacks or liftbacks, the Volt gets a solid 7 out of 10 points in our exclusive trunk comfort index. You can fit quite a number of these large roller bags back here. It's a little bit of extra storage space underneath this trunk area. And a nice feature is we have a handle, so it's easy to close the trunk. Moving to the front seats, you'll first notice that the Volt employs a trick that a lot of other efficiency vehicles employ. That is, there's no power seat for the driver. It means we also don't get any adjustable lumbar support here either. We do have her have a tilt telescoping steering wheel with a decent range of motion. Let's take a quick look around the interior. Over here we have adjustable headrests. They are two-way up and down. We have the optional leather upholstery in our Volt tester here. Regardless of the Volt, you get hard plastics on the dashboard and on these doors as well. Uh, now the Volt does come in three different interior colors. I personally find the brown interior option to be the richest and most elegant looking. Uh, regardless of your color choice, you sort of have this two color dashboard going on here, which is kind of an interesting touch. Again, hard dash plastics, not unusual. You find these in all sorts of EVs and, uh, and vehicles that are efficiency minded. Moving on to the center stack, we have a seven inch infotainment system. This does come in either this sort of charcoal color here or in a white color. It looks kind of like an iPad uh, or iPod if you get the white interior. Down here we'll find your shifter, parking brake power button, a little cubby that's behind there for storage. Another little storage compartment here. Dual cup holders. These are large cup holders and they easily accepted the largest drinks. Here in the center console you'll find a relatively small compartment because of course the battery is right here in the middle of the vehicle. That runs again the length of the vehicle. Move over to the driver's side, we'll find another 7 inch LCD, and this is the instrument cluster for the Volt. Over here we have our battery status, over here we have a little gauge that helps you uh, stay green by accelerating gently and braking gently. This bottom area is completely configurable, and over here we have our fuel gauge, it tells us how much fuel is in the vehicle and what that range equates to. Down here we have a total range, that's battery power, uh, power plus that gasoline. Now this bottom area is fully configurable and it's configurable by a little knob over here to the left of the steering wheel on the dashboard and that allows you to change those options and view your trip computer over there. Right here we have our cruise control buttons. This is our collision warning, lane departure warning buttons. Over right here we have voice command as well as our radio controls. New for 2013 is this display here that shows you where your power is coming from. So there's a little engine over there and over here is the battery. If you were regenerating, uh, then there would be a green line down here for charging the battery. And if you're discharging the battery, the yellow line would go up there to the top. And the middle tells you the total power that's being used by the car. You can also see our safety systems, navigation. We have our trip computer A and B. Trip computer B is a one-way trip. After having not plugged in, you can see we averaged only 31.3 miles per gallon. That is one of the, you know, quote-unquote problems with the Volt is that if you do charge it, for instance, over 400 miles, we were charging quite regularly, we averaged 50 miles per gallon, uh, but on a one-way trip where we didn't charge, we only averaged 31. So your best, uh, most economical drive in the Volt is when it is charged, of course. Uh, we have our oil display, tire pressure monitoring here. Uh, we have vehicle messages, which there are none of. And then you can change this display to be in kilometers if you so desire. There's also a little tutorial available here. It's built into the system. Let's take a look at the Volt's infotainment system now. If you don't care about infotainment, then just follow those instructions down below to skip on over to the drive section. Everything is operated by these touch buttons. This large button bank again comes in white. If you choose the white interior, it looks quite like an iPod. The only real buttons in the system are these knob, two knobs, and buttons in the center, the lock and unlock button, hazard lights, and this direct access button to our power flow charging and energy information screen, as well as this drive mode button, which allows us to change between sport, normal, mountain, and hold. Key things to know about the system are that it's a touch screen as well as a physical button system. So we have these physical buttons and joystick knob and touch direct access buttons for various functions and you can command things by moving this knob and then hitting enter. But you can also touch the screen so you can touch whichever option you want on the screen. Our particular vehicle doesn't have XM subscriptions for weather and fuel. The system is very logically laid out. Everything is based around this home screen. So let's go ahead and zoom in on that screen so we can talk more about it. 
This is the same system you'll find in a number of GM products from Chevy to Buick, etc. It is one of the best systems that's out on the market right now. Uh, $895 buys you the navigation addition to this system. $495 buys you the Bose speaker package in the Chevy Volt. It's all based around this home screen, as I said. If we click over to Now Playing, we'll see our iPod information or whatever source that you're currently playing from. You can always click back to that home button either on the screen or in those direct access buttons lower in the dashboard. We have that same energy screen we saw earlier. We have direct access to navigation. This is one of the easier to use and higher resolution and most responsive nav systems out on the market right now. I don't say that lightly. It's definitely an awful lot more responsive than my Ford Touch and even General Motors' own Cadillac Q product. Uh, in, in addition, I should mention when comparing those two products to this system here, that uh, Cadillac Q, as well as my Ford Touch and my Lincoln Touch, etc., they all crash fairly regularly. Every time we've had a vehicle with either of those two systems on it, they've crashed repeatedly, and none of the Buicks or Chevys that we've had with this brand new system have ever crashed on us. Uh, they're also a lot more responsive than those other systems. You don't get the fancy pinch to zoom on the screen like you do in those other systems, but the system does work very reliably. Going back to the main menu, we have our phone interface, direct access for XM, AM, FM, our climate control, etc. Scooting on, we have access to Pandora, Internet Radio, and Stitcher Smart Radio. Those operate as apps on your iPhone or Android device once an Android app is available. There isn't one available at this time, so these are strictly iPhone at the moment that we shot this video. We have our auxiliary input over here, Bluetooth audio streaming, single CD player in the dash, iPod or USB device, it changes based on what you have plugged in. You should also keep in mind that the system does provide enough power to charge your high draw USB devices like an iPad, etc. Config allows us to alter our vehicle settings as well as system settings here. Tone is where you'll find uh, your bass treble adjustments, etc. as well as surround sound if your vehicle is equipped with that. If we scoot on over to the next page. This is where you'd enter a destination in the system. System is very responsive for uh, address entry compared to a number of systems, and we'll show you how that works here. Uh, so if you type in an address, if I actually had knew how to spell it, there you go. You can see, you can see how quickly this system responds to your input. It's quite a bit faster um, than a number of competing systems as far as entering an address into the system. It's one of the best that's out there on the market. Definitely faster than Ford system also faster than Chrysler's or Toyota's. Points of interest, of course, previous destinations, and all the other usual things that you'd find in a normal system. All these are voice commandable, as you would expect as well. Uh, and the address entry for the voice command system is very logical in this system. Uh, you just read the entire address, 123 Main Street, uh, anywhere California, in that format, and the system just enters it right away. Fuel and weather reports, again, drawn from XM satellite radio information. You do need a subscription for those, as well as for movies. On this side over here, we have pictures. You can download pictures from a USB device and have them displayed in this system. If we go over to our Now Playing option, we can explore the iPod interface. It is a fully featured iPod interface, not just uh, laid out here, as you see in this system, but also in terms of voice commands, very like Ford's Sync product in that respect. You can voice command any aspect of your USB or your iDevice, albums, genres, playlists, etc. If we go over to our power flow screen, you can see where the power is going, just like every other hybrid on the market. We have our Voltec electric-only unit there. Little engine is in the shadowy area right here. Battery pack displayed, and sort of as its physical shape in the vehicle there. Charging tells you how long it will take to charge on different uh, power levels, so 240 volts or 120. One thing to note about this car is that it automatically defaults to 8 amp charging at 120 volts. If you want it to charge as fast as possible on 120 volts, you have to change that option each and every time you're in the car before you turn it off, otherwise the car will default back to that 8 amp mode. And you can see what a difference it makes in our charging time. At 12 amps, it would be charged by 6.15 a.m. Right now it's 7.03 p.m. If we try and change it to 8 amp reduced charge mode, that time extends out to 11.30 a.m. You can also change your charge mode, whether you uh, want it uh, immediately charging upon plug-in, delayed based on your departure time, or delayed based on electric rates and departure time. And you can program all of that into the system. Over here on Energy Info, you can see what's been happening since the last time you have charged the vehicle. It's really just since the last time you plugged it in, not since the last time it was fully charged. So you can see in the last 174 miles, it's only been fully charged once. That's 10 kilowatts total. We used 4.46 gallons. 
average of 39 miles per gallon. Over the entire about 5,000 miles that this car has been driven, the lifetime fuel economy is 46.8, which jives with uh, OnStar's reports for uh, what other typical Volt owners are getting. Uh, according to GM, the typical Volt owner, according to OnStar, which does report to your generic usage information to them, runs in EV mode about 63% of the time versus uh, maybe about 40% in this trip. You can see your energy efficiency. You can see how the car is grading you for your driving style. Apparently, I'm driving very poorly right now. One thing to keep in mind is that if you're going uphill, no matter how gingerly you drive the car going uphill, you're always going to get a bad driving score. And I was just climbing a 2200 foot mountain, so that didn't really help anything there. You can get energy efficiency tips right over there. On the climate screen, you can see how much power your climate is drawing. We're getting an 18% score because, of course, we have the uh, system on auto, and that will use the air conditioning if it feels like it. Out on the road, the Volt drives very much like an electric car or very much like a hybrid, depending on the mode that the car is in, and the car is always adjusting the mode all by itself. 0 to 60 ranges from 8.6 seconds to about 8.8 .8 seconds, depending on whether the car is operating in EV only mode or in hybrid power split mode. It's not a mode that you can control, that's just how the car does it. So if your car is operating essentially like a Toyota Prius or a Ford C-Max Energy Hybrid where the engine and the electric motor are both motivating the vehicle, that's when you get your best 0 to 60 time. If it's operating in EV only mode, then you get about 8.8 .8 seconds or so. It's a little bit slower just because there's not quite as uh, high of a torque advantage with that motor alone, whereas in the power split mode it can use both to optimize the output. When the Volt is in pure EV mode, acceleration feels just like a Nissan Leaf or any other EV out on the market. You get the swell of acceleration from that electric motor, lots of low-end torque, lots of overall torque in that motor, and the acceleration is very smooth all the way up to about 100 miles an hour or so. When you're in hybrid mode, things are a little bit different, and they're not quite like a normal hybrid, you know, normal hybrid being a Ford or Toyota hybrid, I should say, uh, because this hybrid system has two different modes. It has that serial mode and the parallel mode, and the car will switch between them whenever it's most efficient to do so. So if you're on a hill especially, you're going maybe about uh, 40 to 50 miles an hour or so, the car will want to switch out of serial hybrid into parallel hybrid or out of parallel hybrid into serial hybrid mode, and that switch is fairly pronounced when you're on a hill because you're trying to accelerate up the hill and there's you know, maybe about a half second or so where everything seems like uh, it stops, seems like the acceleration stops as it switches mode. And that's because that smaller motor generator in this transmission has to stop spinning about five or 6,000 RPM in one direction and switch speeds and start spinning five or 6,000 RPM in the other direction. And then things have to reconnect and then the car can go forward. It's really kind of a rare situation. Really only happens if you're only in that hybrid mode uh, and you're going up a steep hill like that and you need full throttle acceleration. If you're in partial acceleration or if you're in pure EV mode, you'll never experience that mode. If you're driving on flatland, you'll also never experience that mode and all the mode shifts are very smooth in this transmission. And that's what makes this very different than something like a Ford C-Max Energy or a Prius plug-in hybrid because those hybrid systems don't change modes. They're, they're just in their usual old hybrid mode all the time. Uh, turning on the engine really doesn't cause much of an impact in the way those systems feel. In terms of steering feel, the Volt is a close second to the C-Max Energy out on the road, and both of those are a whole lot better to drive than a Prius plug-in, which is frankly quite boring. In terms of handling, this is also a close second to the C-Max Energy in absolute numbers. And that's primarily thanks to the C-Max's wider tires. Now, all these hybrids and plug-in vehicles and EVs all use low rolling resistance tires, and that really is the limiting factor when it comes to absolute grip and absolute handling. However, in terms of handling feel, the Volt is the superior car in this small segment. Compared to the C-Max Energy, the C-Max um, just feels a little bit heavy. Uh, it also feels a lot rougher, and that's just due to the suspension design. It's, it's a little bit harsher. Uh, the Volt has a slightly softer suspension. It's slightly more compliant, but it doesn't really give up uh, much in terms of handling feel out on the road. The Volt is much more confident than the C-Max, even though it doesn't really grip as well as the C-Max. It really could be rectified with tires. In fact, if I were to buy a Volt or a C-Max or even a Prius plug-in, the first thing that I would do is swap out these low rolling resistance tires for something slightly grippier. I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily go for grippy summer tires, but something in a sportier all season would definitely be my style. You will lose some fuel economy in that transition, but you'll gain an awful lot of handling. 
and that would really suit the Volt fairly well because the Volt's chassis seems to be well tuned for handling on these winding mountain roads and it's really just these tires that lets the Volt down. In terms of overall feel out on the road, the Volt will take a little bit of getting used to if you're currently driving a Ford or a Toyota hybrid. And that's because of the way that this transmission works. Since it's both a serial hybrid and a parallel hybrid, it doesn't always operate the way you would think that it would. So in a Toyota or a Ford hybrid, the engine speed is pretty much directly one-to-one -one linked with how fast the car is going in, in, in real terms. So if you floor the car, you get a lot of engine noise and a lot of engine revs and then a lot of acceleration. In the Volt, you floor it and you get a lot of acceleration followed at some point or another by an engine revving up. So the two are not necessarily in sync. And then once you've sort of leveled off your acceleration, the engine will keep revving up for a while and then it will slowly drop down to a dull roar. And the reason for that is just that the car doesn't need the engine to accelerate. It uses that battery pack in the electric motor to accelerate itself. Therefore, it leaves the engine and its generator to operate at a more efficient RPM at a more leisurely pace, really. So it's not efficient to just rev the engine up right away quickly like a Toyota or Ford would do. Um, but the Toyota and Ford systems need to do that in order to accelerate. This Volt doesn't need to do that, so it can afford to let the engine rev more slowly and more efficiently, and then tailor off more gradually at the other end, which is also more efficient. It just takes a little bit of getting used to because it sounds very different than a normal car, but if you have one of these, it'll become second nature after a while. I think that General Motors has done everyone, including themselves, a disservice by calling the Volt an EV with a range extender because a lot of people have strange and irrational objections to EVs that they then translate to the Volt. They say, oh, well, I have a long commute so my, a Volt wouldn't work for me. And there's no logic to that argument because you don't run out of electricity in the Volt. You just have that electric motor uh, you know, run by your gasoline engine. So you still put gas in your Volt and you can drive it 300 miles and fill it up at a gas station and drive another 300 miles just like you would a regular car. But these people translate that onto the Volt because they see electric vehicle in the title and they think, oh, well, I can't have one of those because I have a long commute or something. Um, and that's not what the Volt is about. The Volt really is a solid hybrid vehicle that can also operate in an EV only mode for you if you have the ability to charge or it can operate as just a regular old hybrid if you can't charge. You know, there's no necessity that you ever charge your Volt. Um, and it's telling that General Motors has decided to call the Cadillac ELR a hybrid vehicle and not an electric vehicle with a range extender. Hopefully it won't suffer from the same stigma that's somehow been translated very mistakenly onto the Chevy Volt. Pricing for the Volt ranges from just over $39,000 to just over $45,000. That is, of course, excluding any cash on the hood or any tax credits, rebates, etc. Now, that is a little bit more expensive than the Ford C-Max Energy, even when it's fully optioned up, and it is a decent amount more than that base Prius plug-in. However, this runs about twice the distance as a Ford C-Max plug-in, and about three times or four times the distance, depending on how you drive it, from that Prius plug-in. It's about half the EV range, however, of that Nissan Leaf. However, I have a hard time comparing the Volt to any of those other options, and here's why. Because the Prius won't use its battery pack exclusively unless you drive it like a grandma, stay under 60 miles an hour, and accelerate extremely, extremely slowly. If you need heat in that Prius cabin, it's always going to turn on the engine. The Volt won't do that under pretty much any circumstances. The Ford is somewhere in between. It has about 20 miles of range instead of 11 in the Prius plug-in, and it will try and leave the engine off as much as it can up to about 80 miles an hour, so you really can get on the freeway with that Ford C-Max Energy. But its range is about half of this Volt's range. Now, of course, once the Volt runs out of battery power, then you switch to uh, the range extending mode, in which case you don't really get terribly good gas mileage when you compare it to the Prius, which gets 50 miles per gallon, honestly, and the Ford C-Max, which gets around 40 to 41, even though Ford is claiming higher. Still, 40 to 41 is better than 31 to 35 in the Volt as we've been getting it. And of course, you compare it to the Nissan Leaf, and after 80 miles is over, that Nissan Leaf has to charge for a very long time, whereas with the Volt, once your 40 miles is over, you just add some gas at any old gas station, you can go on for another 300 miles. Which of these vehicles is right for you really depends on your commute, your driving style, as well as your acceptance of range anxiety, because unlike a regular electric vehicle, the Volt doesn't have any range anxiety associated with it. However, you do get the ability to drive completely electric only at any speed for that first 30 to 40 miles, depending on how you drive. Something like the Ford C-Max Energy and the Prius plug-in just can't do that. However, the Prius is going to be the cheaper car to own and operate if your commute is somewhere in the in-between 
say between 50, uh, 60 miles plus, then the Prius plug-in is going to be the cheaper car to own and operate. The Ford C-Max Hybrid operates somewhere in the middle because its gas mileage isn't quite as good as that Prius, but it is better than this Volt. If you stuck with me to the bitter end of this video and didn't skip that infotainment section that I offered, then go ahead and congratulate yourself. You are my favorite YouTube viewer of the day. Go ahead and click on that subscribe banner at the bottom of your screen so you can be updated on all of my latest videos. Click on over to my review of the Prius plug-in as well as the Ford C-Max Energy plug-in hybrid. Comment on this video, tell me what you liked, what you didn't like, and of course, send me messages right here on YouTube to tell me what you'd like to see us review in the future, as well as what improvements we could make in our reviews.